Good morning, New Life. We hope you're doing good. We're going to uh, we're going to throw some songs back on you. We're going to do some old stuff this week. Here we go. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know. Saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust. His cleansing blood Just in simple faith To plunge me Neath the healing Cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus How I trust Him How I proved Him More and more Jesus, Jesus Precious Jesus Oh, for grace To trust Him more I
Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. They tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home when no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore how beautiful heaven must be sweet home of the happy and free Yeah. 
more days to labor, and I will take. If you have your Bibles, grab those. We are going to be in Romans uh, chapter 12. We're going to look at one verse this morning. Uh, Romans 12, 12 is where we will be. So you can uh, flip over there or you can be on your devices uh, getting to that place. And so I uh, just want to take a moment uh, and let you know that this coming week, uh, we're going to be putting out some videos just to kind of update us and uh, try to project out when we will gather again uh, in this place. Had the opportunity this past week to meet with um, our staff uh, and pray through some things and look at some stuff and uh, try to organize some things as we look to proceed in the future, uh, as well as having the opportunity to get with our uh, trustees and put some things together and just look uh, at ways that we can be safe, look at ways that we can get back together uh, again and gather uh, corporately. And so for us, what we're looking at is we're just eyeing the end of the month. Uh, don't want to give a date yet as we just uh, are cautious and as we wait and just kind of see what some of the new numbers, some of the things that the CDC and kind of uh, the government, what they kind of roll out or suggest. Uh, again, we, we uh, want to uh, just uh, come up under their authority, come up under their leadership and, and take in and, and assess really what uh, they're suggesting, what we're looking at. And so even with that, um, we'll be rolling out some changes when we do come back together. Um, it'll look different. It'll be different. Uh, again, as I said last week, uh, the way we do children's ministry, the way that we gather even in this place. Uh, again, safety is our main concern. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is have anyone feel uncomfortable uh, in this place or uh, in fear of in this place. And we definitely don't want you to feel uh, judged or secluded by continuing to meet online. So we're going to continue to roll out uh, even when we gather corporately our online services. And, and again, in, in the coming weeks, we'll have uh, information uh, for you as it pertains to when we do get back together, what all that will look like. Um, I mean, our hopes uh, are high in doing that very, very soon. Um, and so again, like I said, this coming week we'll roll out some different announcements and some different things as we project and, and look to the future. Um, so that being said, I want to say this. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, happy Mother's Day. Um, and, and no, it pains our heart that we're not together this morning. Um, uh, but we just we want to say happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers uh, here at New Life. We love you. We miss you. Um, and I'm going to do what I've done in the past years is we're going to open up God's Word and we're going to look at it. And I believe um, the totality of God's Word is so important for us 
uh, as believers, whether a mom, whether a dad, uh, whether kids, whoever you may be, that, um, that, that we just look at God's Word in general and allow God's Word to permeate our hearts. So whether you're a mother this morning uh, joining us online, uh, we just want to say that we believe God's Word is there to inform us, to shape us, to mold us all the more into the image of Jesus. And so there's no specific uh, Mother's Day message uh, from His Word. We're in a series called Flashback where we're just going back and we're looking uh, at Romans 12 and kind of walking through some verses there as Paul addresses the believers there in Rome uh, to be living sacrifices. And so I believe this morning for you to be the best mother that you can possibly be is to be one that loves Jesus ferociously, to be one that submits to everything that he says and walk that out and live that out amongst your kids, amongst your spouse. Um, and so again, we just want to say happy Mother's Day. And we are excited to see how God's word is going to shape and mold you all the more as a mother, uh, shape and mold you all the more as a believer of Jesus. And so um, so like I said, last week we just pressed into Romans 12, 9, and 10. Uh, we continued out what Paul was saying, uh, and we just looked at what, what he meant by us knowing and believing that God loves us, what that does to us, what that stirs in us, how we can display that kind of genuine love that Jesus modeled and showed for us. And so he just tells the believers there at Rome uh, to let their love be genuine, let their love be real, let their love be sincere. And then he tells them to have nothing to do with evil but hold fast to good. And he says that our love for one another should be so close and so real that it's modeled out as brotherly love. And so then we closed last week by looking at how he said that we should try to outdo, almost this thought of, of one-upping each other. So as believers, because of this love that Jesus has showed to us, this love that Jesus has modeled to us, and because we can uh, know love because he first loved us, as a result of that, this love should uh, compel us to live out and to act and to be a certain way to the point where it's like we outdo each other in love. Like we try to outdo one-up one another all the more. So how can I take care of you? How can I honor you and make you... Uh, important to make you feel valued. And so Paul instructs the believers here at Rome to do uh, that very uh, thing. And so this week, we're just going to continue looking at Romans 12, and we're going to see how Paul instructs the believers here this morning to be a living sacrifice. I'm going to ask if you would join me as we pray, and then we will jump in uh, to our scripture here in a moment. Father, we love you. Jesus, we need you. Again, thank you so much for the mothers in our church. Uh, God, we hate that we can't gather together this morning in this place corporately to honor and to love and um, to just say thank you in person. Uh, but Father, we pray that you encourage them through the reading of your word, through the proclamation of your gospel. God, we pray that you permeate the hearts of not just moms, but anyone who would hear this morning online uh, your word proclaimed. And so Father God, speak to us, help us to, to dive in and to understand in a greater way your heart, your desire for us as your children what, what we're to do to be lived out. So, Father, again, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you're doing in, in us in this time of difficulty, in this time of difference. God, help us be your hands and feet in our community. Father, we love you. We need you. It's your name we pray. Amen. So all of us, every single one of us, we all encounter trials. We all encounter difficulties. We all encounter sufferings throughout our lives. It's just inevitable. It's going to come for us. And, and I would imagine even more so now with what we're going through, with what's happening in our culture, in our world. Uh, these are trying times. These are enduring times. And I believe that this morning that this word that God has for us here in Romans 12, 12 is going to help maybe encourage, help uh, combat that a little bit. It's going to help lead us and guide us. But hear me, God's sons and daughters, for us as God's people, we can overcome these difficulties, these challenges, these struggles through following the example that Jesus has set for us. For following examples that Jesus set for us. And so we all encounter trials. I don't care who you are. You're going to encounter trials or difficulties or suffering throughout your life. It's going to happen. If it hasn't yet, you just haven't lived long enough. But it's coming. It's going to get you. And so Jesus warns us, and he even tells us that life can be difficult. That life can be hard from time to time. That there's going to be these things that are going to come into your life. They're going to uh, upset or going to uh, change the course that you're headed. John 16, he says it like this. He says, I have said these things to you. So he's like, I'm telling you these. I've told you this, that in me you may have peace. Jesus says that there's true peace found in him. But he says, in the world you will have tribulation. Think about that for a moment. 
He says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Not that you might have tribulation, not that you possibly could have tribulation, but that you will have tribulation. Jesus tells us that we're going to have difficulties. We're going to have struggles. And it has nothing to do with how much you love him or how much you don't love him. So all this prosperity nonsense, if you look at it through those lenses, then it had to be that God hated the Apostle Paul, which we know not to be true. And so Jesus says from his own mouth that you will face tribulation, that you will face trials, that these things will happen, that it's a certainty, not that maybe or could be, but that you will have this. And so why is that? Why is that the case? Why does stuff happen to the believer? It's because we have a real enemy. And that real enemy wants to do what? Still kill and destroy is what the the Scriptures teach. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy us. Why? Because what we believe is contrary to what he stands for. The enemy wants glory. The enemy wants honor. The enemy wants fellowship. That's what he wants. And everything that we believe and stand for is contrary. One, to him to the flow and the pattern of this world. It's everything that we stand and believe uh, uh, in. It's contrary. It goes against that. And then two, it's even contrary to the very nature of who we are. We still fight the flesh. We still battle the flesh. And then Jesus encourages his disciples as he continues on here in verse 33. He says, "But, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So what Jesus tells us in John 16, 33 is that he's told us this. It's coming, that we're going to have tribulations that not might, but we will have tribulations. There's peace in him, even in those tribulations. And take heart because he has overcome the world. He's overcome the system. He's overcome these ways. And so just because that we are Jesus, we because, just because we belong to Jesus doesn't mean that we're immune to this. It doesn't mean that this, this will go around us or not mess with us. I would argue that it's quite the opposite because we do belong to Jesus. Tribulations are coming for us. Difficulties are coming for us. This world can't stand us. That enemy that I've talked about despises and hates us. And so as a follower of Jesus, we don't have a buffer that just deflects this, this hurt, these disappointments, these pains from entering our lives. We don't have just a buffer. No, we have one that we can run to that sympathizes with us is aware of our hurts, has walked the same road that we walk, that can relate to us in that way. So this morning in this small but yet powerful verse, what Paul's going to do, he's going to provide us with with three vital keys to responding to hardships. He's going to say choose joy and hope. He's going to say be patient. And he's going to say to continue to pray. Just press in and pray. So so let's jump into God's Word. The first first key we're going to look at is this. He says this in 12.12. He says, rejoice in hope. And I feel like anytime I talk about rejoicing or I talk about joy, I feel like I just need to define it. Because in our culture, in our world, man, we, we delude and we mess up things when we go to defining things in the world. And so joy isn't like happiness, which is just based upon happenings or, or whether things are going well or whether things are not going well, then I can have joy. That's, that's not what the Scriptures teach is joy. See, joy remains even in the midst, in the midst of, of difficulties and sufferings. Joy can still be present in trials and hardships. Joy is an emotion that's acquired by the anticipation or the acquisition or even uh, the expectation of something great or wonderful. That's where joy is birthed and comes from. And so joy is a deep-seated contentment, a satisfaction, not based upon circumstances or situations, but based on an ever-present reality that's only found in Christ Jesus. See, joy isn't based on the circumstances or happenings around us. Joy is based upon the soul, where the soul finds rest. As I read earlier, where where Jesus says that He is peace, and that's where satisfaction is found, is in Christ and Christ alone. So joy is that deep seated contentment. And what we know about joy is this, is that joy is what? A fruit of the Spirit. So joy is not something that you can just muster up if you try harder. Or if the circumstances or situations change, doesn't necessarily mean that joy comes with it. But joy is found in a relationship with Christ and the Holy Spirit in dwelling us. What he does is he seals that all the more, the fact and the reality that we belong to Christ. And as we belong to Christ, there's great joy in that, knowing that we can lay our heads down at night 
fearing nothing that man can do, nothing that situation can throw at us, nothing that circumstances can uh, upset us with. Because for us, found in Christ Jesus, our joy comes in the reality of what He has purchased and what He has done for us in eternity through the cross. That's where joy is found. And our world and our culture does not define it like this. The rejoice in hope. What, what does it mean to have joy in hope? The hope is looking forward to a confident expectation. Joy is looking down the road and being confident in the outcome of what's going to take place. And so for us as believers, things may go really bad, but yet it won't rob us of joy. It doesn't steal our joy. Why? Because we have our hearts set on how good it will be in the age to come and in the presence of Christ after death, that's where our joy is found and set and sealed. We, we, we've got to get our eyes off of the here and now. We've got to get our eyes off of us. I mean, we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. He has purchased and redeemed us. We belong to Him. Our lives belong to Him. And they're to be lived out for His glory regardless of the circumstances or situations got to get our eyes off of us. We get Jesus, and Jesus is the one who has given us everything that we need, who has set us for eternity. And so our joy is rooted in hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ, because He is who He says He is, and the empty grave proves that. The empty grave proves that. And so this is how we can live out what Peter's going to point to next, this joy. This is how we can live in joy, even amidst what he's about to say. He says this as he continues on in verse 12. He says, be patient in tribulation. Patience. What, what in the world is patience? Right? We live in a here and now world. Give me, give me, give me. Do, do, do. Why didn't I have it yesterday? Amazon can ship it to me in two days, and I can't even have something that I need from God uh, right now. And he's the creator of everything. I mean, patience is something that we don't practice very well. Patience is something that we don't live out. And look at what the Apostle Paul says. He says, be patient. If he had said it there, but I'd go, okay, we can move on. Let's do this thing. We, we can practice it. But it's be patient when? He says, in tribulation. I don't want to be patient in tribulation. I want tribulation gone. I want tribulation over. Tribulation is not, not a fun thing to go through, is it? I mean, I mean, who wants more months of this, what we're going through right now? I mean, it's trying times. It's difficult times. It's uncomfortable times. I mean, who's signing up for a little bit longer like this? I mean, if anybody wants to get together, if anybody needs people in his life, it's this guy. Man, I'm not the introvert type person. I need people in my life. I mean, I want to gather. I want to be encouraged by your stories and what God's done in you. I, I, want to, I want to see your smiling faces and hear how you've been faithful to follow Jesus even in the midst of craziness. And that encourages me. That presses me on all the more. And what we see here, Paul saying, man, be patient in tribulation. And so tribulation is unique, especially here in Romans 12, right? I mean, we see things mentioned like love and joy, hope, patient endurance. And all of those things are things that we experience. All those things are things that we do. But tribulation is something that's done to us. Tribulation is something that happens to us, that comes after us. Love, joy, hope are all virtues, and they rise in the soul by God's grace as something morally good. But tribulation is something that's pressed in on us. Like we're just minding our own business, doing our own thing, and then this came out of nowhere, or that came out of nowhere, or this circumstances arose, or somebody acted like this toward me, or somebody did this toward me and caused tribulation. And so we, we see that. We, we see that happen. We know that. Tribulation is not a virtue. It, it's not in the category as a moral act of the soul. No, tribulation is the normal experience in a believer's life caused from an outside force. It's the setting for all of our love and our joy and our hope and our patience and our prayer. It, it, it sets up for us to be and act and do and respond in a certain way that brings glory and honor to God. And so... Affliction, affliction in our lives can extend from anything from cancer, conflict, even to death. And, and all of those things are normal, and they are part of what we must live with as we are on our way to heaven. 
Tribulation and difficulty is a part of this because of a fallen world that we live in. And so what Paul is doing here is he's just stressing that joy will flow from hope, not in the presence of good times, but the presence even in hard times. And if you don't think this is true, then, then you just haven't lived long enough, or you haven't been through long enough yet, or, or maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you haven't followed Jesus like he's asked you to and surrendered your life to him. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's why you can't experience joy in tribulation. That, that you can't be patient in tribulation. Difficulties. I'm not saying that I like it. I'm not saying that I'm longing for it. I'm not saying that, I, that I'm wanting it. But what I do know is this. And, and though I mess up and I blunder, make blunders even in as a believer, when I get through or when I'm working out of it, when I look back, I see the work that God has done in me as his follower. That's what I love about it. That's, and knowing that my joy hasn't shifted from the reality of who Christ is and what he's done and knowing that he's got a plan even in the midst of whatever it is that I go through. Whatever it is. And so Paul doesn't give up on joy. He commands it over and over and over in his writings, no matter what the circumstances or circumstance or situation may arise. Paul says here to be patient in tribulation. Because God uses that tribulation, as I said, to shape and mold us all the more into the image of His Son. God will use it to mature us, as well as remind us of our hope that's found where only in Him. And then look at how Paul ends this verse. Look at how he ends it. He says this, he says, Be constant in prayer. And so I want, I want you to pay close attention to what Paul's doing here, because this, this is important. Because with prayer, what we do is we savor and we see what the beauty of our hope. In prayer, we savor and we see the beauty of our hope, which is found where? In Christ. And so what prayer does is it allows us to voice our struggle, our frustration, our aggravation in that tribulation to the one who can actually do something. To the one who can actually do something. And so when we face difficult situations, Paul encourages us to, to remain faithful in prayer. I mean, think about it for a moment. Let's look back. Let's flash back for a second to, to Jesus himself in the garden. Or maybe him even on the cross. In his greatest moments of agony, what does he do? He turns to the Father in prayer. In his greatest moments of difficulty or struggle, what does he do? He turns to the Father in prayer. And not only that, what is he? Jesus is constant in prayer. You see him every opportunity he gets. What does he do? He slips away to do what? To go pray. He slips away for a moment to get alone with the dad. But the Father, he's modeling and he's showing those disciples and even us here today in our world of our great need to be in fellowship with the Father, to be constant in prayer. I mean, that should be our heart, that should be our motive, that should be our attitude. Just as we go throughout our day, as we just talk to God, we just have conversation with him, we just share our hearts, we just pour out praises to him, we, we just thank him over and over and over for his goodness, for his love, for his grace. And Jesus models that, and he flashes back to that often in, in the Scriptures. See, if God in the flesh models this, and if God in the flesh shows us how to do this in his great need and dependency on God, how much more do we need that? See, the, the Scriptures, this is what I love about the Scriptures, God invites us to cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us, is what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. He invites us into that. And cast all of your anxieties, all of your struggles, all of your troubles on Him. See, prayer helps align our hearts to joy. And that joy that is only found in Christ, no matter the circumstances we're in. It, it gives us a different perspective. God uses prayer. But I believe God uses prayer in a mighty, mighty way. Maybe not to change circumstances so much, as much as He does to change our heart to change our perspective, to align us all the more with Him. So, so church, may we be constant in prayer. May we be constant. May this be known to us. And what, what are they doing? What, what, as a neighbor, what are you doing? I mean, they're just praying. They're always out walking, and as they're walking, and as they're doing their stuff, or as they're out mowing grass, they'll stop, and they'll have conversation with me as their neighbor. And as they have conversation, I mean, they're always asking me, how can I pray for you? 
or whenever we get back to normal, whatever that looks like or whatever that means then in days coming, uh, as we're out eating or as we're out doing something or as we're out at the store picking up something, man, imagine the opportunity that we have to engage people like this, to, to live this. This is easy, church. This is so easy to be constant in prayer as you're out picking up your groceries or you're out doing your thing, man, just to, to pause as you're paying, being, paying for your groceries or your food or whatever it is. I mean, how can I pray for you this week? I mean, don't tell me that the world isn't hurting, that they're not struggling, that there's not great opportunity to engage even in prayer. I mean, I mean this should be said of us. I mean, they're, they're constantly praying. They're constantly talking to this God that they so believe in. So we encounter the storms of life. Our joy, our hope, our patience, our prayer, and our worship can have a tremendous impact on others. The world's falling apart. Lives are falling apart. And what do we do? The, the, the believer rolls up. I'm not saying that we have it all together, but saying that we've got a God who does. And we're going to talk to Him on their behalf or our behalf. And so this week, as I, I was just kind of studying and looking at this, I came across a story um, that, that I think is pretty amazing. They'll kind of help outline this. And it was a, a story about how a group of people uh, uh, impacted John Wesley's life. And, and so the year is 1735, and you have John and Charles Wesley, and they're on their way to America as missionaries. And you've got this group of uh, Moravian uh, immigrants from Germany who, who were also on the same ship that they were on. And, and you have this terrible storm that arises in the sea. And, and they're in danger of being shipwrecked out in the middle of the ocean. And the Moravians, they, they were there in the midst of this storm. They're down in the boat, and they're just having a worship service. They're praising God with so much intensity. Wesley is terrified. He is scared to death. And Wesley recounts in, in his diary, this is what he says, In the midst of the psalm wherewith this service began, the sea broke over, split the mainsails into pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed them up. He says, a terrible screaming began among the English people. The Germans calmly just sung on. And I asked one of them afterwards, I'm Wesley, a missionary coming to America to spread the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus. He says this, I asked them afterwards, are you not afraid? The man looks him in the eyes and says, I thank God, no. I thank God, no. I asked, but were not your women and children afraid? And he replied mildly, no. Our women and our children were not afraid to die either. The storm was boisterous, but the Moravians kept praising God and finally, the storm subsided. Man, what a picture. What a, what a picture. We, we, we see this even with Jesus and his disciples. I mean, John Wesley coming to America as a missionary to proclaim Jesus. And he's on a, group, uh, on a boat with these group of believers from, from Germany. And the storm arises and they're not even aware of the storm. Why? Because they're so focused on Jesus. They're, they're so uh, enthroned by Jesus Christ. And they're worshiping and they're praising him. The boat's falling apart for Pete's sake. And it doesn't even matter to them. Why? Because they are so constant in prayer and worship of who Christ is that life means nothing in the midst of the storm. Even to the point where their children and their women are afraid for their lives to be taken because they get the thing they've longed for forever, and that's Jesus. Oh, church, if we would live this out and be constant in prayer, may we stay constant in prayer. In this time, in the good times, no matter what time it is, may we keep our heart on Him regardless of the tribulation or the difficulty that we face. I mean, I urge you in this time, pray. Pray, pray often. For yourselves, for your loved ones, for the world that God will just reveal to them who He is, what His hope is like. And may you, may you feed your life with prayer and relationship with Jesus. May 
you focus in on him, may you be constant in him, the one who can sustain and keep you. So, so as we encounter difficult times in our lives, we can flash back to Jesus as our example. And we can know how to respond with what joy, with patience, and with prayer. So if I was to sum up Romans 12.12, 12, I would do so like this. Tribulation, trouble, calamity, conflict, cancer, death, all of these are the normal conditions of life in a fallen world. But, but Christ has come He has broken into our tribulation and He has taken it on Himself. He has carried our sin. He has bore our curse. He has absorbed God's wrath and He has become our righteousness. He has conquered death, hell, and Satan and He has opened the door of paradise for all who will trust Him. He made His glory the center of that paradise so that we would have the highest pleasure possible. So church, in this hope, we rejoice with joy. And in this joy, we endure with Jesus and all the sacrifices of love. And so this week, may God bless you. May he keep you all the closer to himself as you press in and you stay constant in prayer. Don't see the storm. See the Savior. Don't look to the turbulence. Look to the one who controls and is over the turbulence. Man, may God bless you. May he use his word to shape and mold you all the more into the image of his glorious son so that you can live as a sacrifice every moment of every day. May God bless you. And may he use his word to do that. Father, we love you. Jesus, we need you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for hope. God, thank you for patience. Thank you for joy. All of those are sweet, sweet gifts given to us by your Holy Spirit. God, fill us, I pray. Help us be your hands and feet in this world. Jesus, we love you. We need you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hope you have a great week in your life.